We have here a 71-year-old male who's had quite a long history of coronary disease. Since 1978, he's had numerous myocardial infarctions. He's had two coronary bypass operations, the first one in 2004, the second one in 2007. Since then, he's had 10 stents put in, and in November of 2010, uh, because he presented to us with uh, pretty much end-stage ischemic heart failure, we placed a HeartMate 2 LVAT from which he recovered pretty well. So he's doing relatively well at home since his VAT implant in November of 2010. But a couple of weeks ago, while he was trying to change over from the console to batteries, uh, he, the VAD just stopped working and he actually went out. Um, they switched him over quickly, his family was with him. And after interrogation, we realized that the uh, drive line or lead had failed. Uh, so he was rushed to the hospital, and over the ensuing few days, uh, some technical uh, uh, support personnel from the company came and tried to fix it. They were unable to. And so yesterday, we had to perform a VAT exchange. Uh, this uh, occurred without uh, any incident. The, the VAT exchange took about three hours. Uh, after the operation, upon arrival in the ICU, we inserted an IMACOR probe, which we do in all our VAD patients, because for the first 12 to 24 hours, we have an indwelling probe that enables us to adjust the speeds, optimize them, and also uh, to diagnose any problems that may arise, such as tamponade or right heart failure, before they become clinically significant. What you will see is uh, Dr. Gadia doing that immediate post-op transesophageal echo using the small amicor probe. Uh, the HTE probe is uh, excellent in showing us uh, very nice images of, the f of both right and left ventricles, really all chambers of the heart. It also enables us to see if the aortic valve is opening or closing, which also helps us in terms of uh, how we adjust the RPMs. So it gives us all the vital information to uh, basically guide us with respect to what the RPM should be on both right and left sides and that enables us to therefore optimize the flows on both sides. So as you might imagine, the post-operative care of a heart transplant or an LVAD patient is quite difficult. Uh, oftentimes they're hemodynamically unstable and we watch the pressures on the standard uh, monitor that's at the bedside, but what we really can't see is cardiac function directly, at least until now. Patient BM postoperative day one after LVAD exchange, the setup speed from OR it's 8600 RPM, the PI is 6.2 and the pump flow is 5.3. Does have a CVP of 12 and um, mean arterial pressure of 77. In the stomach, the IMACOR probe is placed in the stomach. We are having the short axis of the uh, left ventricular cavity mitral valve, inflow cannula of the LVAD, we do have the interventricular septum and part of the RV, you can see it here. We place color over the inflow cannula and we see very nice uh, laminar flow, there is no turbulent flow, which means the cannula is it's functioning well. I am withdrawing from the stomach, I am in the junction with, uh, between the stomach and the esophagus, you see the interventricular septum, you see the right ventricle, which is dilated, he's home dependent on milrinon. You see part of the AICD and part of the swan guns, mitral valve. We can notice here that interventricular septum is in the middle. This is kind of modified four chamber views. We do see the right ventricle, left ventricle. I don't see the lateral wall. We get pictures better. I'm focusing on the inflow cannula that is closer to the septum. You can see part of the outflow cannula right here tricuspid valve, mitral valve, very nice interventricular septum in the middle, interatrial septum in the middle. Color over the mitral valve, it's a, uh, quite a significant mitral regurgitation at the speed of 86 RPM. Again, mitral regurgitation. Already we made adjustment of the speeds, we increased the speed to 8800 and you see less mitral regurgitation than before. We do see the, infl the, the outflow of the left ventricle. This is the aortic valve, and we can see at 86 RPM, the aortic valve is opening with every beat. This is RV cavity and swan guns inside. This is um, contrast in the right heart, and we can see the right ventricular size, and we can see the, the um, 
uh, decrease uh, contractility of the left ventricle. We do have mitral valve, interatrial septum, interventricular septum, tricuspid valve. Pump speed increased to 8800, pulse index 6.3 and power 5.2. We have a CVP maintained around 12, a mean pressure increased to 81 from 77. The first 24 hours, as most surgeons know, um, is a time when most surgical complications will happen that need to be addressed. So as a surgeon, uh, uh, the, uh, the bottom line is I need to know, is there a technical problem that needs to be addressed by me? Or does it need to ad be addressed with speed adjustments? Or a change in the cocktail of drugs we're giving to improve right heart failure. The Imacor probe is a very interesting device. It allows us to see cardiac function in the early perioperative period when we worry the most. Sometimes we don't know for sure whether the patient is tamponading or whether it's right ventricular dysfunction. Sometimes we don't know for sure whether or not it's just severe left ventricular dysfunction that's causing the hemodynamic compromise. So with this intervention, we have the opportunity to see these patients and to see their cardiac function in real time. And this has been a game changer with respect to the management of these post-operative patients. With the introduction of the Imacor probe, the world has changed. For the first time, we have the opportunity to actually see left ventricular dysfunction, right ventricular dysfunction, and pericardial space in real time. Quite often, it turns out, that these patients have right ventricular dysfunction, which requires an adjustment in their inotropes, but sometimes it turns out that the reason that the urine output has fallen is because they've developed tamponade. And this is a very nice device because it allows us to distinguish between right ventricular dysfunction and tamponade, or for that matter, left ventricular dysfunction. And so we've really adopted the Imacor probe as basically standard of care in the early perioperative period in our LVAD and our transplant patients, unless they're absolutely hemodynamically stable. We have a group of intensivists uh, that have embraced uh, this technology, as well as our heart failure cardiologists, who actually were the initial ones that uh, insisted that we have it available. But our intensivists are both cardiac anesthesiologists and CT surgeons who have decided to devote the rest of their careers to working in the open heart unit and taking care of our patients. This probe is so easy to put in, it's obviously a slam dunk for the cardiac anesthesiologists who put in traditional probes every day. But even for those who are not echocardiologists, like our surgeons, it's extremely easy to put in. They may not be able to read an echo as, an e as a cardiologist can, but when it comes to the basic things of ruling out tamponade, of looking at the LV and RV to make sure they're well enough decompressed, pretty much anybody can read that. What's nice about the HTE probe is that it is so small that you can leave it in. In the intubated patient immediately post-op, it's like leaving an NG tube in. You can come back uh, every few hours, every hour if you want, and just uh, hook it up to the monitor and look at the heart. It's, it's wonderful. You don't have to keep reinserting a large TE probe. It enables you to um, continue to adjust the RPMs as you wish and to rule out uh, any uh, evolving tamponade. One of the big dilemmas we have in the first 12 to 24 hours uh, after implant is, are we dealing with right heart failure or are we dealing with tamponade? And uh, if it's two in the morning, you do your best with the hemodynamic parameters you have available to you from your SWAN, et cetera, uh, to try to make that decision. You'll increase the inotropes, you'll give volume, but why do all that and get to a point where you might have a patient almost arresting before you have to open the chest? Why not just have an easy answer so that you can deal with the actual problem that exists in the correct fashion rather than you know, do, do everything, give volume, give inotropes, et cetera, not knowing what you're dealing with. And why risk the fact that you have to open emergently in a patient who's by that time possibly become very compromised rather than open less urgently uh, and uh, not compromise the hemodynamics, you know, of the patient at the time. Here is uh, basically the potential for a continuous monitoring device that's there in the first 24 hours when I may really need an answer quickly. Uh, no one will argue that 
it's better in these situations to have the answer sooner rather than later. The reason why I think this is such an important investment is not only because of what I've seen it can do to improve our outcomes, but because I really foresee that this will become standard of care. I think that the HD probe definitely helps you make better decisions faster. Uh, this is real-time imaging of the heart. You're not uh, making, in making inferences from Swan GANS numbers. Uh, if your app is dropping, you don't know if that's from needing volume or from tamponade or in the case, let's say, post-op day one or two from a, a transplant. If uh, you've got someone who's developing nephrotoxicity from the immunosuppression drugs. So this, this really does help you uh, make better decisions faster.